Yek peina. Good morning. Or maybe it's yek tiotak. Might be good afternoon by now. I greet you in the native language of my people, the Nawa. The language is Nawat. Greetings to the Lisjan and Muwekma and all Ohlone peoples. Honor to all of our ancestors and elders everywhere. I was four years old. I was sharing a bedroom with my three siblings in a very small house in San Francisco. One night, I woke up because I was really afraid. I heard drums. Dum dum, dum dum. I went and got my mama and I said, Do you hear them? They're coming after me. Do you hear the drums? She said, No. Who? I said, the Indians. And as I got more scared and more afraid, it drummed faster and harder. Doom, 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 doom. And it turned out, it was my heartbeat. I was four years old, scared of my own heartbeat and scared of my own people. My grandmother's generation suffered through La Gran Matanza, or the Great Massacre, in 1932. Upwards of 30 to 40,000 indigenous peoples were killed in just two weeks in El Salvador, AKA Cuscatan. They were murdered for speaking their native tongue in public. They were murdered for wearing traditional dress. And they were murdered for having a face that looked like mine. Her generation was taught to survive by never seeming indigenous, disclaim all the roots, a feat that was not difficult because the Salvadoran government removed Indio from the census in 1930 in an attempt to officially eliminate all native people. My mother's generation was taught to feel humiliated for being outed as an Indio. Indios were considered stupid. My generation and my first gen American schooling taught me to be afraid of Indians and their savagery. I was taught that Indians were violent against peaceful pilgrims. I was taught patriotic songs and the Pledge of Allegiance because it meant my freedom. So at four years old, I was scared of the Indians and the drums. Why? Who taught me this? Let us hearken back. Here's a grossly oversimplified history of about half a century. All right, here we go. Europe, 1300s, the bubonic plague. Wiped out between a third and half of the population. Somewhere between 25 and 50 million people died. Terrible deaths. Just decades after that, they started to make their way over here to the Western Hemisphere. Despite enlightenment, medieval torture practices were still in place, like the rack. The Middle Ages, all the way up through arguably the 1800s, Europe was full of war, famine, pestilence. It was a time of great suffering and great scarcity. So imagine the trauma, the intergenerational trauma, the depravity of spirit they experienced. And they brought all of that with them here in the 14, 15, 16, 17, and 1800s, and they found themselves here in this stunningly beautiful land of abundance. And instead of celebrating that gift and learning how to live with the people who were already here and already loved these lands, their unhe unhealthy mental states led to violence, greed, and extreme dehumanization. In order to control lands, colonizers from Belgium, England, France, Portugal, Spain, the Vatican, they committed many genocides. Genocide, meaning the killing of thousands of people to control land and territory. And as genocides go, and as the Lakota Nation versus US documentary says, they made invasion look like self-defense and then they criminalize indigeneity. Trauma, when left unaddressed, can turn into a callous disregard for life. That callous disregard for life that allowed for such brutal bloodshed and later the transatlantic slave trade is the same callous disregard for life that allows for exploitation of the land, extraction of the minerals and nutrients 
a rampant pillaging of the earth, mass denaturization destroys the natural world and the human spirit, leaving room for that disregard for life to turn slavery into mass incarceration thanks to the 13th Amendment. Prisons, bastions of hypercapitalism. My dear friend Nainan, who's been in a Texas prison for over 30 years, since the age of 17, for a crime, by the way, that he did not commit, he spends $1.92 for a 30-minute phone call. If just half of the state prisons in Texas have the same phone system as Nainan's prison, that would amount to 3 million $538,944 in one month. $3,538,944, the amount of profit these companies make off of human suffering is abhorrent. A private company, a private company called Securus has 3,400 contracts with facilities across the nation. It charges exorbitant prices for people to stay in touch with their loved ones. I have to pay 60 cents for every single email that I send Nainan. That's why it's a $1.5 billion company. It makes most of its money from the poorest and the vulnerable families of this nation, a third of which end up in debt trying to stay in touch with their loved ones. So when people tell you that prisons are about community safety, they are lying to you, to themselves, to their creator. Prisons are about industry and making the rich richer. What we have in this nation is a trauma to prison pipeline. 96% of people inside have experienced trauma and prison conditions just make it worse. I have a student uh, in a California prison, she's part of the prison education program at UCLA. She told us once, this class is the first time I've ever felt human in my life. Because of a lifetime of abuse, she had never felt humanized until she had a professor asking her for her thoughts on the farm workers movement led by Dolores Huerta. Because there's so little protection for people inside of prisons and the people who work in prisons, they're often built on toxic lands or repurpose military bases, like one of the prisons I teach at, which is rife with forever chemicals, heavy metals, radiation, asbestos. There's 6,000 carceral facilities across this nation, prisons, jails, detention centers, and many of them are built on old industrial lands. Here's how it works. A coal mine is abandoned, and because owners are responsible for the cleanup, they sell that property for dirt cheap, or should I say toxic dirt cheap, prices to the government as they've done so many times in Eastern Kentucky. The government buys it, puts in another 50 to $400 million to build a new prison. So imagine all the companies profiting off of that construction. And then they continue the damage because prisons pollute with impunity. Thousands of violations, and the EPA hardly blinks an eye. But what about the thousands of species that are impacted by the contaminated soil and waters? Each insect, each rodent, every single bacteria, fungus, plant, all the trees, all of our relatives, they all play an instrument in this symphony of our ecosystems. But these toxins silence their music forever. You remember? A couple of years ago, the mycelium fungal network was all the rage. And what we confirmed then was that it's all connected. So harm done to the land in a uranium mine turned federal prison in Colorado can reach every drop in Niagara Falls. So it's harm on top of harm on top of harm. We punish the land the way we punish people. We punish people the way we punish the land, and we do this because we are alienated from our humanity and the natural world. They call this species loneliness, our inability to connect with nature. In prisons, 
We call that solitary confinement. A place where my friend Nainan has spent a significant amount of time as a twisted manifestation of the human disregard for our need for connection. But what we should be doing is working with local native nations and ecologists to make amends with Mother Earth. And it's already happening. Um, thanks to decades of advocacy from tribal nations, the biggest dam removal and river restoration in history started in 2023 on the Klamath River. Uh, we heard about this yesterday from Sammy. And an entire ecosystem is coming back from extinction. To date, 1,200 dams have been removed and more is needed to continue to rewild the land. Just as the border walls, prison walls, apartheid walls have to come down, so do those damn walls. And forests. So for centuries, indigenous communities across the world have been using cultural burns to help forests flourish. This practice was outlawed in California in the 1850s, and guess what happened? Major wildfires began. Who remembers Smokey the Bear? He taught us only you can prevent forest fires. He trained me to think that anybody who started a fire in the forest was evil and a jerk. And just like that, thousands of years of wisdom went unheeded, and a shirtless bear <laughs> whose name doesn't even make any sense given his message. He trained generations of children to think that the real enemies were the only people who truly knew the land. But thanks to decades, I don't even know how long, of advocacy, uh, the law changed in California, and now indigenous communities across California are starting to practice cultural burns again. Mm. Mm. Native practice need to continue to be decriminalized. And the mighty Maori of Aotearoa, they've secured personhood for a river, a lake, a mountain. They are world leaders in teaching the globe how to indigenize. And here's the thing, if we don't do it willingly, if we don't undam the rivers and undo the shackles and the prison cells we put the natural world and our people in, nature will resist. The largest lake west of the Mississippi was drained for farmland and for residences in the Central Valley of California. Hmm. But then in the very wet winter of 2023, rain reflooded 150,000 acres and Tulare Lake came back. Yeah. Now, homes were lost, farms were lost, livelihoods were lost, and that is a tragedy, but Mother Nature's gonna get what she needs despite these tragedies if we don't do our part of the healing. And we can do this, y'all. We can heal the land, we can heal the people, we can use restorative practices for the land and restorative and transformative justice practices for the people. When people harm each other, it's often a result of unaddressed pains. You've heard that uh, hurt people hurt people. The other side of that is we are all victims of victims. So we have to break these cycles of violence by allowing room for healing and redemption. This nation has suffered mass alienation from the colonizers to the genocides, to the kidnappings from Africa for the slave trade, for uh, imperial foreign policy that forces migration, many of us walking these lands were cut off from our roots. And healing requires reconnection to those roots. Stretch back, stretch back, every single one of you, to a time where your people were one with the natural world. Every human has a direct connection to source. Find it if you haven't already. And don't engage in spiritual tourism. You don't need it. You don't. If you don't have access to your people's ceremonies, that's okay, start new ones. 
Because the more that we each strengthen our roots, the better we'll be able to do away with this destructive and lonely alienation that has become our norm. And as we reconnect to our humanity, we'll have to get rid of prisons because we won't be able to stomach them anymore. We've only been stuck here because of a crisis of imagination, but what we learn from the artists is that you can imagine things into existence. So imagine this. You're looking at a concrete building, razor wire everywhere, sniper towers, zero vegetation. It smells acrid. You can sense the human suffering from being in cages. Now let that image shift into a healing center. Various structures, various shapes, spacious, it's open. The colors are warm and inviting. It's meditative. There are trees, plants. Importantly, there's a garden. People are growing things. This place is alive. At Four Freedoms, we think it's crucial for every person to allow the artist within them to wake from its slumber if you haven't already. You know why? because the creator created you to create. Nature is not shy about its beauty, and neither should you be. Because as we connect to the collective imagination, we won't have to traffic in this mundane realm of what's realistic. Hmm. 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 You got yourselves now, though, because there's something I want you to do. <laughs> So what can you do? I want to ask something deeper of you. What I'd like is for each of you to strengthen your relationship with truth. Some call it intuition. Others call it a sixth sense. I call it your core. But as we strengthen our intuition and connect to our core, we can globally turn on a collective understanding of what it means to be one with the natural world and with each other. And you can do this through prayer, meditating, journaling, trusting your body when it reacts. People who have had near-death experiences, they share that when they were dead, they were enlightened to the fact that we are all one. Not in some aspirational, abstract way, literally one, one organism. I am you, you are me, the Mbutu concept of I am because you are, the Baha'i idea of the, human, the unity of humankind. We are interconnected. And as you connect to your inner truth, we'll all be able to benefit from the gifts that you've been bestowed and the mission you were given here on Earth. And if we don't listen or we choose to ignore our intuition, then we'll do things that people respect, but that's sucking the life out of us. You will make other people proud, but you'll wither away inside. You'll do righteous things, but you'll betray your own heart. Rumi says, your heart knows the way. Run in that direction. My own journey of the last 10 years of listening to my truth has brought me back to my heart. Now what? The native language of our people is a very heart-centered language. For example, the word to think is yuldagetsa, but the literal translation is conversation with my heart. So to think is to speak to my heart. Nawat has grown and deepened my roots. And now I look back at that tender age of four, and I've got new patriotic pieces in mind. There's a poem that says, I pledge allegiance to the flowers, serenading the sun with the ancient sound of spirituals and honeybees for which they stand open hands to pollinate the land, every nation living free, just so we can all breathe in their miracle. That's from a poem called Natural Anthem by a poet and my friend Brian Bain from his book, Black Magic. 
I'd like to close with an invitation to you. If you feel so moved, you can repeat after me. If you don't feel moved, you can bear witness. My traumas are not my fault. My are not my fault. But it's my responsibility to heal. I will do my part in healing these lands and healing my history. I love everybody in here. I love everybody in here. Bayush. <laughs>